So this lecture uh, is about uh, basically the importance and the impact of network topology. So some of this is review, so I'll go fairly fast through this. Um, you know, remember we in the first day we said that the characteristic time is the longest from your sources to your tanks. So these are the you know the arteries of your system, uh, and you have to be very careful. Um, and you know that type of stuff is the you know the type of stuff that makes the news if you have a big uh, transient event occurring there. So um, you know our our job with Hammer is to try to avoid shocking the system any more than we have to 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 operate it. Uh, the other factors you can't really control, um, but how you operate pumps and close valves, uh, those are things that are that are within your control. Um, so two different types of network topologies that you can have. The main two are, are looped systems and branched systems that you can see right there. Uh, looping generally attenuates the transient, transient energy more since it has different paths to go and uh, the way that the, the waves combine uh, just tends to dampen things out better. Um, branches, when that wave hits the dead end, it can re, you know, return and with the opposite sign, uh, basically two, two times the incident pulse. So topography, so this is, you know, talking about elevations, um, high and low points in the system. So, you, you know, things like going under rivers, uh, deep dish, you know, ditches, going uh, along bridge decks, uh, risers from underground uh, wet wells, uh, things like that. Those can be, uh, you know, significant things that you have to keep in mind. Uh, so elevations in profile, so, um, you know, the difference between a positive pressure and full vacuum is basically 10 meters. Usually the vapor pressure limit at, uh, at most elevations is uh, 10 meters below zero. So it's, you know, we're not talking a huge amount uh, in length units. And a sustained vacuum will result in the creation and collapse of vapor pockets, as we saw. So. The point here is that you know the elevations are important. Any high points where you have that potential for uh, vapor pockets to form, uh, those are very uh, important to consider. Um, and obviously, any errors in those pipe elevations can uh, really have an impact, uh, be, be significant in the transient response. So um, here's an example here. So the importance of elevation. So to check your results. You can use flex tables, um, sort them by elevation, and then you know check your highest and lowest points. So you could you know open up a junction table, sort on elevation, uh, take a look at the highest and lowest ones, and those might be ones that you might want to you know focus on in particular because you know maybe you have a profile that you're looking in the looking at in the transient results viewer, but that may just cover one path. There might be some significant high or low points elsewhere in the system that you, you know, may not be covering in that profile path. Um, you know, if you have a large system, you'll probably be checking, you know, quite a few elements. Um, and in that case, you can take advantage of color coding, which uh, some of you are probably familiar with. We didn't really cover that yet, but uh, the same color coding concepts that you can use in WaterCAD and Water Gems can be applied to Hammer as well. So normally you have your element symbology docked over on the left side here, and this is to control your uh, your labels, your annotations, your color coding, and that sort of thing. So if you wanted to, you could say create a new color coding for your junctions based on elevation, or you could even create a color coding based on minimum or maximum uh, transient results. So if you wanted to uh, get a sort of plan view overview of the uh, you know where are, where are the minimum and maximum transient pressures occurring? You can say right click on junction new color coding, and then you get a list of all the different attributes that are saved in in the model. So for example, pressure minimum transient is the minimum pr minimum pressure that occurred at that node over the course of the transient simulation. So you could say um, you know find the range of those. And then you can click this third button from the left over here to initialize a range uh, using the five steps that were entered as default. And then you can even ramp the colors so that you have sort of a gradient. And then if I apply it, you can see 
you get uh, you know an overview with colors of where are the highest and lowest pressures and you can even do a right click on that color coding entry uh, insert a legend select an area right click scale and there you have a color coding so you can see that the ones that are in green are the ones that are you know basically below zero for their minimum and the ones that are red are the ones that are above 130 and you can you know customize that range so let me switch back over to our slides okay so um, when it comes to investigating transient problems there are some other things you can look at so things like uh, scatter records, uh, photos of, of past transient damage, maybe if somebody took a video of pipes shaking or something, uh, maybe you can actually firsthand see uh, displaced equipment or, or twisted pipes from you know shaking around or moving from the transient forces. Uh, there could be written notes from from the past. Uh, you may need to look at equipment totalizers. Uh, maybe there's Maybe you have some colleagues that might have some anecdotal experience with these things, or um, maybe you can find case studies or you know analogies to similar systems or similar types of, of operations. So these are these are the types of things that you might want to gather before you do a transient analysis. Um, system configuration, so um, demand and supply supply relationship relationships so um, some questions you might have are you know what type of demands should I be looking at for a transient simulation so usually what you want to do is consider the maximum and the minimum hour so you know during high demand periods for initial conditions you know, your velocities tend to be higher and your pressures are lower which means you know there's a higher potential for sub-atmospheric pressure to form during a transient and you have you know, generally you know higher uh, momentum from that that water moving at a higher velocity but at the low demand periods you tend to have your higher pressures which means a potential for a higher maximum transient pressure so you know for that reason it's usually a good idea to at least uh, check both conditions so as far as um, pump selection and uh, pump station layout that's that's another you know consideration uh, dead ends and networks so this is another sort of topological consideration here so if you have a lot of dead ends in your network uh, you know those can be a water age concern that's you know sometimes why you need to flush the system um, but they can also have an impact in the transient response in the way that the waves are reflecting off those dead ends um, and also if you're draining part of the system that can result in, in a cavity you know a, a pocket of air at the, at the dead end and you know those pockets could basically collapse when the system is refilled so uh, sometimes there's a need to model you know what happens when I refill my pipes that's that's a question I get sometimes sometimes uh, you know you're dealing with a system that maybe the pipes are, are empty or at least part of the pipes are empty and you want to see what happens when you know the pump is turned on and those pipes are are refilling and you know as we talked about before you know hammers basic basic assumption is that the pipes are flowing full and they're pressurized you know hammer can model localized pockets of air and vapor but you know the basic assumption that that is built upon is that pipes are flowing full so the further you get away from that the more your results are going to be skewed so usually when you're dealing with a, a sort of pipe filling draining situation um, y you wouldn't really be modeling the entire pipe being starting empty and then filling up you would be modeling a situation where you have a a pocket of air that's still that that's initially at the end of the pipe that's that's you know basically leading to the atmosphere so typically you would model that using the discharge to atmosphere element and there's an entry that you can make in the properties for the initial air volume so you would put an initial air volume there and you would set up the hydraulics of the initial conditions such that uh, the pressure is basically zero at that discharge to atmosphere element and then when the pump starts up it it starts to expel that air pocket which you know as we talked about before the air pocket is just you know localized at that uh, at that one node it's not going to you know travel throughout the network so you're basically going to take a look at what happens when that air pocket is fully expelled uh, will there be a 
uh, a transient effect, a water hammer occurring, you know, just as that last bit of air is released. So that's typically, uh, you know, how that would be modeled. Um, another point, so often you have major water uses, users at dead ends. So if, you know, things like factories uh, that have fast open water intakes, big hotels that require a lot of water, uh, those are usually the ones that you have at the, at the dead ends. Um, you know, sometimes you have closed valves at zone boundaries, and that basically forms a, a dead end. Um, as far as leaks go, you know, where, where do you normally have a, a leak in your system? You know, that could occur at local high points where your air release valves are, or if you have maybe a manual blow-off valve uh, that allows air to accumulate. Um, in those situations, you know, you definitely want to include the automatic air release valves at those points to you know, make sure that um, you know you're you're expelling the air bubbles and that you're you're protecting those high points uh, at least somewhat. Uh, you know, so they they can open up and let air in. Uh, if you have a a you know event that occurs that drops the pressure below zero. Um, also, river crossings. So, you know, upstream of the crossing, pipes will become more steep, and because of that, the water may not be able to entrain the air as, as the pipe moves downward, and so air can accumulate there. Um, and that's why, you know, usually a, an automatic air release valve is used on the upstream side. Um, also, the pipe bedding or anchors could shift if the soil is muddy, if it's around a river. Uh, that's a potential concern if you're looking at transient forces, especially. Um, and there's been, you know, many recorded uh, breaks that have occurred around such areas. Um, so another point is that, you know, transients decrease performance. So, uh, you know, one thing is that it causes service interruptions. So your water customers, uh, if that's the type of system you're looking at, they'll be, they could be out of service and there's economic losses, uh, lost productivity. Uh, you might have contracts with you know, key users. There's obviously a lot of problems associated with uh, service interruptions. Um, there could be water quality degradation. So if you have rapid flow velocities occurring in a transient event, that can loosen any sediment or rust that, that's, that would otherwise just sort of sit at the bottom of your pipes. Um, flow can reverse direction and, you know, <laughs> take contaminants places that it, it shouldn't. Uh, and obviously sub-atmospheric pressures can actually suck in things from the, the surrounding soil, and those are all uh, water quality problems, and then you run into, um, you know, issues with uh, uh, the environment, and uh, you could have fines there, um, and then last but not least, obviously, there's physical damage that can occur as a result of a transient. You know, we saw the photos of, uh, you know, degradation to pump impeller from cavitation, uh, you know, the the shifting, the physical shifting of joints, uh, things can be dislodged, uh, and just the general wear and tear in the pipes. And you know, ultimately, if they burst or, uh, or, or you know, sort of implode, then you know, you're you're stuck with replacing the pipe. And obviously, that's uh, very costly compared to doing a transient analysis and implementing uh, a surge mitigation strategy. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like. If you want to see more such series, consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you, and see you next time.